He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. What a joy to be together here in the Lord's house as we gather for worship. Of course, it's very different this time around as we are not together in person, but we are still gathered around God's wonderful gifts, and so we celebrate that. The reason we are so joyful today is recognizing that of all the things we celebrate in the Christian faith, this is the central issue, that Christ has paid for our sins and risen from the dead, and we have life eternal in Him. We'll take a look today at the good news in the Gospel lesson about the resurrection of Jesus and why that is so important to us. We pray that you are all well and that you are rejoicing in the Lord.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Christ has risen from the dead. Alleluia. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. Alleluia. Alleluia. Let us come before God in true repentance seeking his mercy and forgiveness. O God, our Father, we admit and confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and in in deed. We confess that we have not lived as your followers, but have sought to go our own ways and directions that have not brought glory to you or blessing to others. We confess that your love has not reached others through us in every situation, that there have been times in which we have been loveless, thoughtless, and judgmental toward others, unwilling to help our neighbors as we ought. We confess that your will has not been our priority at all times, and that we have not always been defenders of the weak and helpless in our circle of family, neighbors, and friends, and beyond. We confess that we have not used every opportunity given to us to witness to the resurrection faith that is ours and have at times been slow to speak of the hope that is ours in Christ. Upon this your confession, by the command of our Lord, I, a called and ordained servant of Christ, Forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light. Grant that we who have been raised with him may abide in his presence and rejoice in the hope of eternal glory. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading is Acts 10, verses 34 through 43. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. 
And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. If, then, you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Welcome to an object lesson for Easter Sunday morning. I've got an object here, and oh boy, if you find one like this at your house, I bet you expect that there's going to be something really good, because this is a big egg too, right? Well, let's find out. It's empty. It's not what I expected at all. There's nothing in here. It's just a plastic egg. Sometimes these things aren't as we expect. That's what it was like the first Easter Sunday morning. The women went to the tomb expecting to find Jesus. They were very sad. Kind of like us this year because we can't meet as God's people all together. We're glad that we can meet this way, but we're kind of sad that we can't meet together. We really would have enjoyed being together in worship. The women, that first Easter Sunday morning, they expected to find Jesus' dead body. But it wasn't there. Instead, there was an angel that said, he's risen. And they were terrified. They didn't know what to do. But once they thought about it, once they understood that Jesus has risen from the dead, they were very excited. It wasn't what they expected, but it was something much better. For our Easter celebration, one of the things we often say is, He is risen, and you're supposed to say, Alleluia! So let's do that together. You can do it at home, even though you're not here. He is risen. And we say, Alleluia. He is risen. Alleluia. We can praise God for that. I pray that your Easter celebration will be a wonderful one. Let's have a little prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for not giving us 
sometimes what we expect, but giving us something much, much better. New life in you, forgiveness, and all of your love. Help us to share that with everyone. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Well, probably there are some fears that you are dealing with right now in your life related to the COVID situation. Perhaps you're fearful that you will become infected yourself or that somebody who you love very much will become infected and become ill. 
We worry about, am I taking every precaution that I need to? Am I caring for my family members? Is it safe to go out? We worry about the consequences. For example, what will the economy be like when all this is over? If I've lost my job right now, will I have enough to provide for myself and my family? And perhaps, will I have a job when this is all over? Those are legitimate fears. We also recognize that the rest of the time, in other words, when things are normal, we have not only our fears individually, but also our fears over the whole world, and they're different. For example, if you look all over the world, if you go to Africa, what do most people in Africa worry about? Well, they've done research, and most people there worry about AIDS and other diseases. If you go to Asia... Most of the people there worry about pollution and the environment. In the Middle East, it's religious and ethnic hatred. And here in the United States and also in Europe, the greatest fear is inequality among people. Fear is a very central issue in the gospel lesson for this Sunday. And we see that, we recognize that in what happens in the resurrection of Jesus. We look and we see what's going on in the gospel and we see that, all right, all of a sudden the women come to the tomb and they bring their spices and their flowers and an angel of the Lord suddenly appears and says, he is risen. He says, don't be afraid. It also says that the soldiers who were still there also feared and trembled so much that they become like dead men. Well, fear then for the women and for the soldiers. But the fear is not the same. And that is a central point to our message for today. The soldiers and the women are experiencing two separate kinds of fears. And here's how we distinguish between the two. The soldiers are experiencing a fear that is based in terror, in horror. It would be similar if somebody broke into my house or if they threatened my life with a knife or a gun or if they assaulted me on the street. It's a fear for my life. It's a fear, again, that is based in terror and horror. That's the soldiers. But the women, on the other hand, come and they have a different kind of fear. It's a fear that's based in respect and love and admiration for the Lord and for God, recognizing that God is God Almighty and that Jesus our Lord is his Son. And so you have the soldier's fear and Mary and the women's fear. Now that has a lot to say for us today. Remember that the Bible says that God in his love and mercy sent Jesus Christ into the world to die for our sins. And he has washed away all of our sins and he has risen from the dead. But God also makes clear that that salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that without Christ, then God does come to the unbeliever with justice and with wrath, death in this physical world, and also everlasting hell. And so just like the soldiers, those who don't know Jesus Christ, those who don't have forgiveness through faith in him, should have terror and fear before God. Because without forgiveness, they are facing everlasting death. On the other hand, we recognize that for those who are in Jesus Christ, we still fear the Lord, we still respect him, we still honor him, but it's a fear like a child to a parent or to an adult. It's based in respect, not terror and horror. Well, we know as Christians that Christ has risen from the dead, and that is the central joy of our life. This is the highlight of the Christian year. In other words, everything else in Christianity wouldn't matter were it not for Easter. And so we are over this time. But yet we recognize as Christians that many times in my life, I don't live knowing that Christ is risen from the dead. In other words, in my faith, in my head, in my heart, I know it and I believe it. But in terms of my experience in life, I don't live that way. And let me explain. 
where do I spend the majority of my time in my head as I go through every day of my life, every hour of my day? Where is my head? Very likely I'm going through thinking about how am I doing at my job today? I'm thinking about how are my finances? What if my car breaks down? I'm thinking about will they have the medication that I need at the drugstore? Maybe I'm thinking, you know what, so-and-so over there is angry with me. I wonder what these people think about the job that I'm doing. How am I getting along with my friends and family? In other words, even though in my head and in my heart I trust in Christ and I know I'm forgiven, I spend the majority of my time dwelling on what other people think of me, my fears about my health and death, My fears about my finances, my job and my car, the state of the world, you have it. But the joy of being a Christian is letting all of that play a role, but a very small role in comparison to the joy of Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Now those fears are legitimate and they have a place in life, but they are nothing compared to the overwhelming joy of Easter. And so that means if I do a good job or a poor job at work, Christ is still risen. It means that if my friends and family love me and respect me and want to be a part of my life, or if they leave me and reject me and they scorn me every day for the rest of my years on this earth, Christ is still risen. It means if I am healthy or if I am debilitated or if I die an early death, Christ is still risen whether the economy is good, whether the person I like is in the White House or not, Christ is still risen. Alleluia. And this is the kind of peace and joy that the Lord wants us to have because his son paid the price and has given us forgiveness. Well, if you had to take a guess, which day of the week do you think most people choose to call in sick? Now, we're talking about those times when a person calls in sick and they're not really sick. Now, I'm sure you've never done that. But for those of you who have, which day do you think it is? Well, by far, it's Monday. No doubt about that. By and large, it is Monday. And of course, followed very closely behind by Friday. In fact, there is one day of the year when more people call in sick than any other. And it makes a lot of sense. It's actually the last Monday in January. The last Monday in January is the day that more people than any other call in sick. And that's because, of course, it's cold, it's in the middle of winter, and many other reasons. Here in the United States, we start our week on Monday. And we have since the beginning of our nation. Monday is the beginning of the week. But not everywhere. Believe it or not, in Afghanistan, for example, the first day of the week there is Saturday. In Argentina, the first day of the week is Sunday. And so it was in the time of the New Testament when Jesus rose from the dead. The Jewish week began on Sunday. Remember the events that happened with Jesus in his passion. It's Friday, and so the Passover is coming up. And things had to be finished to start for the Passover. So Jesus dies on the cross at 3 p.m. And he is dead. And the Jews know we can't leave him here. If we're going to bury our Lord and Savior, we got to do it now before the Passover begins. And so on Friday evening, the Passover begins. It goes through Saturday. And Sunday is the first day of the week. And that is central to the gospel message. Sunday is the first day of the week. It's also why we worship on Sunday to commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ on that day. So the women come to the tomb on Sunday. Now they're bearing the normal things that you would when you went to a tomb. They're bearing spices, they're bearing flowers, and of course their goal is thinking that Jesus is dead. And his body has started to rot. And so they wanted to come and bless him and honor him with these things. But when they do, that's not what they find at all. And it's the first day of the week. 
Now, why is that important? This issue of a new week. It's the eighth day. It's a new week. Well, remember, what does Jesus talk about on Monday, Thursday? Remember, up until then, there was a covenant of sacrifice. A covenant of sacrifice. Remember, the Lord said that for the forgiveness of sins, you have to sacrifice animals and grain and oil for the forgiveness of sin. That's the old covenant. Now Jesus comes along and he says, here's a new covenant. This new covenant is not based on the sacrifice of animals and grain and oil but instead on my sacrifice. And so in the institution to the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, take and eat. This is my body given for you of a new covenant for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. In other words, Christ has brought something new. His death on the cross, his sacrifice. We don't need animals and grain and offerings anymore. Christ has done all that is needed. And so when I think about the new week, when I think about the new covenant, that applies to you and it applies to me. Paul says in his letters, he says that you are a new creation. He doesn't say that God kind of puts on a polish or that he refurbishes you or renovates you, he says that you're brand new. Remember that as a sinner, I am sinful all the way through, 100%, in my body, my mind, and my soul. Christ Jesus, in his payment on the cross, his death, his resurrection, has now made me brand new, a new creation in Christ, body, mind, and soul. Think of it this way. Let's say that I owe the bank $1,000. I owe the bank $1,000. I pay them $999. I'm almost done. I got a dollar to pay, but I'm still in debt. I'm still in debt, barely, but still in debt. Many people go through life thinking that Jesus took care of most of my problem, but not all of it. That's false. Jesus Christ has taken care of the whole debt, the whole thousand dollars he's taken care of. And how do we know? Because he rose from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is evidence that sin no longer keeps him down. It no longer holds him in the grave. But having paid for everything, now he rises from the dead. And that's our greatest comfort. There are many challenges that have come as a result of COVID-19, and all of us are impacted in some way. There is one group of people that is impacted in a specifically challenging way. We remember that with all of the challenges going on, there are still people who are in the hospitals, those who are in hospice, who are very close to passing away, and those who are suffering the loss of loved ones to death death caused by whatever it happens to be. Now, we take for granted that we can be with our loved ones in the hospital. We take for granted that we can abide with them as they breathe their last breaths, their last moment in this world, and that we can begin the grieving process immediately after they pass. But because of social isolation, those things can't be done as they normally are. These people struggle in a very difficult way. And for that reason, the gospel of Christ, the resurrection, has particularly powerful meaning. When I look at the resurrection of Christ, I see my own resurrection and your resurrection for those who are in faith. Look at Christ. He rises from the dead. He has a glorified body. It is strong. It is holy. It is without any damage or struggle in any way. He is glorified. And that's my future and it's yours. My resurrection is tied to Christ's resurrection, and so is yours. That means as certainly as Christ rose from the dead, you will rise from the dead, and so will I. In faith, we will see our loved ones again in heaven, and we will see them without any old age, any disease, any mental illness, any loneliness, any sadness. And it's there that we will live with him in the same way for eternity. Because Christ Jesus has wiped away our fears, he has made us new, and he is our hope.
Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding garden keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life eternal. Amen. We continue at this time with our common confession of faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was was crucified also for us us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven heaven, and and sits at the right hand of the Father. Father. And he he will will come come again with glory to to judge judge both the living and and the dead, dead, whose whose kingdom kingdom will have no end. end. And And I I believe believe in the Holy Spirit, Spirit, the Lord Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue at this time with our Easter prayers. We begin our prayers with thanksgiving, remembering the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Dear Lord, we give you thanks and praise today for this day of life, for the Easter celebration where we recognize your victory over sin and your death and resurrection. We pray as well, dear Lord, thanksgiving for family and friends, house and home, for all the things you give to us. We thank you today for our first responders, especially those who are on the front lines, doctors, nurses, EMTs, and all medical workers. Dear Lord, we also thank you for the joy of prayer and for the ability to come to you as our Heavenly Father for the sake of Christ. We pray for those who are suffering in body, mind, and soul, remembering the words of Psalm 147. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, you know the struggles all of us deal with. We ask that you would bring to us the Easter message, that we would remember your victory over sin and all of its consequences, the suffering in our body, minds, and souls. We ask that you would care for those who are in pain, that you would give them perseverance, that you would care for us and protect us from despair and loneliness and mental illness. And dear Lord, that you would correct all those who are living in lack of faith, that you would bring them to the joy of the Lord, that dear Lord, you would strengthen those who are in danger of walking away from you and that you would always point us to to the cross of our savior, Jesus. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones reading especially Revelation 24. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Dear Lord, what a joy to know that it was by your death that we are given life. Dear Lord, you suffered on the cross in our place, that we would have victory, not only death in this world, but also eternal death, and instead given life eternal. As we grieve the loss of loved ones, we we pray, dear Lord, that you would direct us to that victory so that we know that we will see those who have died in the faith again, and we will be resurrected and spend eternity with them and you in this way forever. We pray for the ministry of our school, remembering the words of 2 Timothy 3, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. 
Dear Lord, we pray today for the ministry of our school, um, especially during these challenging circumstances where teachers are using technology in new ways, where parents are trying to struggle uh, with their kids, their work, and all the other parts of life. We pray that you would bless our teachers, staff, parents, and students. Keep us healthy and safe. Help us to work together. And always, dear Lord, to make the education and the joy of Christ the center of all that we do. We pray for our missionaries and for outreach, remembering the words of 1 Chronicles 16. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples. Dear Lord, we thank you that through missionaries, you have brought the gospel to each of us. We pray for those missionaries around the world who may have limitations on their work because of uh, social distancing, that you would avail to them other means, um, social media, telephones, letters to continue reaching out. We pray today, dear Lord, also for us as we serve as missionaries in our families, our marriages, our friendships, our communities, that you would use us to reach out in the same way despite the challenges of COVID, that others would know your healing grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We bring before you our special prayers, all those that are not spoken here, uh, that are in our hearts and minds, remembering the words of Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We observe a moment of silence. We continue with our Easter prayers, remembering the words of Luke 24. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to celebrate this day in freedom and to know that as we look to the coming spring and the warmer temperatures, we also reflect on the new life that you've given us in Jesus. Dear Lord, we share in this resurrection because your son died on the cross and won the victory over death and hell. We share in his victory, looking forward to the time when we will see him face to face in heaven. Dear Lord, let this joy go out not only in our community, but also throughout the world. We pray at this time also for COVID and related challenges, remembering the words of John in chapter 14. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, remind us that COVID was never a surprise to you and that you are working through all agencies to help us through this difficult time. We pray that you would bless our president, Congress, our governors, our mayors, and all those who serve in leadership the leaders of churches, and especially those here at St. John, as we navigate these challenges, give us wisdom to make decisions that are in keeping with your plan and that are good for the people that you love so very much on this earth. Dear Lord, give us patience, perseverance, show us how to be healthy. Dear Lord, also we pray that you would ease our anxieties and our fear, knowing that you are always in control. Bring a swift and safe resolution to this challenge for us. Remind us that Christ in his death and his resurrection has conquered all disease, including COVID-19.
because we're not able to gather together for Holy Communion. We take an opportunity right now just to talk through the significance of Holy Communion as we anticipate joyfully the time that we'll be able to gather again to receive Christ's true body and blood together here in His Church. A couple of points to examine and just kind of flesh out what is going on with Holy Communion. Remember back in the Old Testament, there were a number of things that the Lord showed us to point to the covenant, to point to the Passover and the institution of the Lord's Supper. We remember back in Exodus, God says to take the blood of the lamb and to smear it on the lintel and the doorpost. We remember that always in tabernacle worship, blood, the sacrifice of animals, was a big part of sacrifices to God, pointing to Jesus Christ. Passover always included wine and bread and the flesh of an animal of sacrifice. And so we fast forward then to the New Testament. And here comes Jesus. He is now in Jerusalem and he's headed toward the cross. And so he gathers with his disciples for the institution of the Lord's Supper. And following the tradition of the Passover, he says to them, here is the wine, and he says, take and drink. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. He does the same thing here with the bread. He says, take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So we recognize that Jesus is giving us himself. He is giving us himself. Even before he goes to the cross and suffers and dies, knowing that this wonderful sacrament gives us not merely bread and wine as a remembrance, but rather he is giving us his true self sacramentally so that our sins are forgiven and so that we are comforted and strengthened in faith. This is the joy, especially as we celebrate and reflect on this in the season of Easter. We continue with the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day, day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. I believe in the sun. I believe.